before we start talking about thermodynamics in the next chapter, I want us to look at uh, kinetics, which we've already looked at, versus thermodynamics. And as far as chemists are concern, concerned, uh, how long a reaction takes is very important for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that time is money, of course, and also for uh, other purposes like pharmaceuticals, we might want to know how long a reaction is going to, to occur as far as a, as a pharmaceutical drug uh, is concerned. So uh, how long a reaction takes is kinetics, and there, remember, we did quite a bit of math concerning rates. We talked about rate constants and so forth, first-order kinetics and second-order kinetics. Thermodynamics is just as important of a question, and that is will the reaction proceed the way it's written? So with reactants on the left, does that reaction want to go forward to products? Or maybe that reaction would prefer to go in the reverse direction. And we're going to see how equilibrium plays a part in this as well. So we're going to be talking about the universe a little bit when we specifically define the thermodynamic quantities of enthalpy and entropy. First, I want to remind us uh, of, a, of an endothermic reaction versus an exothermic reaction. So for example, uh, if we have a reaction that overall goes downhill in energy, so our energy is increasing in this direction, and if we start with reactants here, maybe we can put um, 3H2 plus N2, we looked at this quite a bit, the Haber process. There's some activation energy that has to be overcome there, but ultimately that reaction goes downhill in energy. So we end up with two NH3s. This recall from the kinetics chapter is the activation energy, which is the energy barrier that uh, keeps the reaction from occurring. And this activation energy corresponds to the breaking of the bonds of the reactants. So a nitrogen triple bond, that's going to be rather hard to break. So this may have a very high activation energy, but once we reach the top of the hill, this reaction goes downhill in energy. So the difference here is what we refer to as a delta E. And most of the time in chemistry, this is very closely approximated by delta H. So if we remember that, delta H, we can look that up in the back of the book in the appendix and solve for that. It's going to be the sum of all of our heats of formation of all our products minus the sum of the heats of formation of all the reactants. If we do this, we'll end up getting negative 92 kilojoules. And we've done that in previous slides, so I don't want to actually do that here. But the, the point I'm trying to make is we have an exothermic reaction because the value is negative. So if heat is given off during the reaction, we say that that is exothermic. And I always say this is going downhill in energy. So a negative delta H is downhill in energy. In this case, the energy that we're talking about is in the form of heat. And this is preferable. Most all reactions do give off heat. So we're going to look specifically in the upcoming slides on whether a reaction is spontaneous the way it's written. So just going downhill in energy, we're going to see, is not the only criteria we have to consider. An endothermic reaction would actually absorb heat. So a simple... Uh, this one. If we have N2 plus O2... Those are our reactants, and we end up making two nitric oxides. Again, 
in energy is increasing as we go up the diagram in both cases. We still have an activation energy here. So that's our E sub A, the activation energy. But the net change from products to reactants is a positive value. So again, this is really a change in energy, but it's very closely um, approximated by delta H. And in this case, this reaction, the net result is it goes uphill in energy. So we call this endothermic. And if I calculated the delta H for this, which I didn't do ahead of time, uh, this would be a value greater than zero because our product's value is higher in energy than the reactants. And the heats of formation for elements recall that those values are zero. So this is endothermic. This means the reaction has to absorb heat from its surroundings or maybe we have to add heat to it. We have to heat up a reaction to make it proceed toward products. We have to add energy to that reaction. And if we add energy, a lot of times that costs us money. Most reactions do go downhill in energy. That's the direction they proceed. So for endothermic, I'm going to write uphill in energy. And this is not likely to occur. This reaction still could occur, and that is going to be the topic of our next slide when we look at the disorder term. The most common example I can think of for an endothermic reaction is if we take solid ammonium nitrate and put it in water. And this is what's in an ice pack. So when this dissolves, it actually absorbs heat from our arm or wherever we place the ice pack. Most of the time when we dissolve a solid, it gives off heat. So an endothermic reaction means the heat has to be absorbed from the surroundings. So if heat is on the reactant side of a chemical equation, this is what we mean by endothermic. And again, this type of reaction is not common. So what we're going to do when we look at the entropy term is see how that, it's a disorder term, the entropy term must be great enough in order to compensate for the fact that this reaction is going uphill in energy. So the sign of delta H is going to be very important. And again, exothermic is favorable or preferable. That means the universe prefers to proceed in that direction. And explaining why an endothermic reaction would proceed without any uh, heat added to it brings us to the concept of entropy. And entropy is another thermodynamic term. And entropy we write with a capital S. That's another state function, which means it's path independent. And entropy means disorder. So we usually don't define something in terms of what it isn't. So disorder is, of course, the opposite of order. So if we have uh, an increase in disorder is favorable. We just think about that for a minute. In other words, that means the universe proceeds in that direction. This universe proceeds toward this order. So all you got to do to verify that is look at your sock drawer, look at your kitchen, look at your closet. It's natural for a state to go from order to disorder. So this is going to be the other term that we have to consider 
on whether a reaction is going to be spontaneous. So an increase in disorder is favorable, so we're going to look at that. And a decrease in energy is also favorable. So we're going to see that if we have a reaction, so if we go from reactants to products, if this is exothermic, and the disorder increases, that means this reaction is always going to proceed to the right. In other words, the way it's written, reactants will always proceed toward products spontaneously. That means we don't have to add any energy to that reaction to make that proceed. So if this is exothermic and disorder increases, then the reaction is spontaneous. It means it proceeds without us doing anything. It's spontaneous as written at any temperature. Reverse is also true. If the reaction as written goes from reactants toward products, if this is endothermic, that means that nature doesn't want to do that. This is uphill in energy. If the reaction is endothermic and disorder decreases, It's the same thing as saying order increases, but we don't define entropy in terms of order. Entropy is defined in terms of disorder. So if the reaction, the way it's written, is endothermic and the disorder term decreases, then the reaction is not spontaneous. So then the reaction ever spontaneous at any temperature. And furthermore, what that really means is the reverse reaction is spontaneous. we're trying to make money off of products over here, we really don't want to try to make products and go against what the universe wants to do. So we, if we have to spend a whole lot of money and add a lot of energy to cause that reaction to proceed to the right, then we're not going to make such a nice profit. So oftentimes the two terms are competing. So we have a delta H term. This is the enthalpy or heat. So that's energy in the form of heat. And we have the entropy term. And so this is the disorder term. And we'll specifically define this in one of the next slides, one of the next podcasts. So we may have. This, uh, when we look at the dissolution of ammonium nitrate, we don't have to add heat to that reaction to make it occur. If we put ammonium nitrate in water, it is going to feel cold in our hands. If we're holding the test tube, our hand is going to get cold. Well, getting cold really means our, our hand is, is supplying the heat for that reaction to occur. So this feels cold to our hands because it's absorbing heat from our hands. So the fact that this endothermic reaction occurs must be because the disorder term is great enough. So on the next slide, we're going to uh, look at 
specifically the laws of thermodynamics and then define this term entropy. And then we're eventually going to look at an equation that we can solve in the thermodynamic appendix and decide from a calculation whether a reaction is spontaneous as written or not.